Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. Today we have Guy Morris. He's an author and researcher, and he's got a quite an interesting slant on um, sci- science, uh, technology. But today's top topic we're going to be talking all about is uh, artificial intelligence, and I'll let him introduce himself. So, uh, Guy, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, uh, kind of set the stage and tell people your background. You've got a quite an interesting background, you know, a lot of things to talk about, but um, set the stage for the audience. Thank you. Well, I, I do have a diverse background. Um, I, I didn't talk about a lot in my early stages for long, for many, many years, but I started off as a, my journey started as a homeless runaway at age 13. I worked alongside migrant workers. I was um, I pretty much on my own from full time. I went back home briefly, but then I was on my own for, from 15 on. Um, I was able to go to I, when I got a chance to go to college at age 19, I saw it as a chance to change my stars. And so I worked extremely hard. I put pretty much everything I had into it, even though I was also married. I was working part time. I had a toddler I had to take care of and My first wife was rather ill. Um, but I graduated with multiple degrees. Uh, I was at the top of the dean's list. I was uh, got given a full scholarship to go to grad school. Uh, I was accepted into Harvard MBA program. And all of that good fortune had to do with the fact that I was uh, exceptional at computer modeling. I created a macroeconomic uh, forecast model that outperformed the Federal Reserve and pretty much every other bank in the nation. And that caught their attention. Um, I went on to a 36 year, 38 year career with Fortune 500, 100 uh, corporations in in software, high tech, uh, global energy, including companies like Oracle and Microsoft. And um, during that time, I was able to um, be at the leading edge of a lot of technology waves that have, you know, basically changed the world in the last 40 years. Um, and I retired a few years ago to uh, pursue a third act career as an author. And one of the key themes that I bring into my books are sort of a combination of artificial intelligence, prophecy, and humanity. Yeah, that's a uh, quite an interesting story and a background. Um, so, kind of, uh, you know, any um, most tech entrepreneurs that have on the show, any discussion would be a miss without talking about artificial intelligence and kind of talk about, you have, you talk about true near-term social benefits and risk of advancing AI. Well, um, AI certainly will be um, one of the most um, uh, profound and fund- and, and um, just astounding changes of technology that we've ever experienced. Uh, the World Economic Forum considers it the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and while that has some good things, it also has some negatives. Um, I first, I implemented early stage AI before it was even called AI. So I've been involved. I, I was aware of the technology, kept up on the technology for decades. It's uh, for a lot of people, it's something that just kind of came on the horizon the last few years with uh, chat GPT. Up until then, most people thought it was more sci-fi, uh, but it's actually been developing um, for, for, a number of, for a number of years and most rapidly uh, since 2018. But I became obsessed with the technology uh, during a time when I had discovered that a program, I I found in a very obscure Associated Press article in the back of a science magazine that simply said that a program had escaped the Lawrence Livermore Laboratories at Sandia, which is an NSA spy lab, the same laboratory that created the Stuxnet virus that brought down the Iranian centrifuges a number of years ago. And so uh, I'm reading this article and saying, OK, a spy program has escaped the NSA. Now, they didn't. It was their word choice that they didn't say it was lost. They didn't say it was stolen. They didn't say it was corrupted. The verb they used was escape. And that grabbed me and would not let go. Now, I either thought my first thought was, oh, somebody at the Associated Press is going to get in trouble for making a boo boo. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, maybe somebody at the Lawrence Livermore lab is going to get in trouble for making a slip. And so I, I started trying to kind of reverse engineer. I said, well, well, how how could a spy program escape the NSA? How would they have to have architected it in order for it to have that capability? Escape implies intent or intelligence um, somehow or, or specific design. 
Um, it implies the ability for the program to move itself, which we know programs can do. And then it implied the ability for the program to erase the uh, computer log trail so that the NSA didn't know where it went. Now, that's pretty special technology. So I spent a few more months trying to figure out, walking through the data center, walking through the offices, trying to figure out that if I'm a spy program, what would, and I wanted to have that spy program essentially invisible, um, what would I want it to do? And I came up with a list of attributes. And at the time, I thought it was just an interesting exercise. I went to a friend of mine at the time who was an um, indie film producer. And we agreed that rather than trying to write a screenplay about it or trying to, um, that I would produce it as a webisode series because I knew that this was a web-based, internet-based program. And so we did. We were extremely successful. We got a number of awards. We were uh, we got fans all over the world, including the director of flight operations at NASA, which was a real surprise. Um, and two, we got optioned by one of the studios. But two weeks before the studio was going to exercise the option, two FBI agents showed up at my door. Now, at, to be honest, at first I thought it was a prank. I thought my friend Jack was was pranking me. I made, they flashed their badges. I said, no, no, let me see those again. And I really looked at them carefully. I said, okay, these guys, these look legit. So I invited them in the house. Apparently they were pretty upset that I had figured out something they thought was supposed to be top secret. Uh, and not only did I know about it, but I was writing about it because I had featured the program in this webisode series, the fact that it had escaped. Um, and what bothered them the most was my snarky attitude. Um, yes, I figured it out. I did it. Oh, come on, boys, admit it. You wouldn't be here if I was wrong. Um, so so I, it, they, they didn't expect that attitude, I think, more than anything. They kind of went pale face, and I got the we are not amused speech. And then my wife came home, and I got the what did you do speech. Uh, so at that point in time, I knew that I would write about it. I knew that I was going to investigate it more, that I was going to get more in tune with not only where the technology was going, but to try and open my eyes and have an open mind as to how it could be used for other than commercial purposes. And that was the beginning of my journey. So by the time I left Microsoft uh, a few years ago, I, the first book I wanted to write was about this artificial intelligence, the one that escaped. And at that point, the technology had advanced so much and so fast that I knew that I had to start a, a series that would talk about those advances and, and start to peel away the various way, things that could go wrong uh, and why the technology was not only the most profound technology we'd ever create it, but it could be as dangerous to society as nuclear weapons. And that was that became the themes in the book. Now, the, the um, for those of you, the, the themes of prophecy and political religious corruption are, are political religious corruption. I think people are, are used to seeing the prophecy element became um, part of how I actually used. I, I wrote I developed a program that tried to validate or invalidate whether or not we were living in prophetic times based on outcomes that had occurred and been documented and then the probabilities of those outcomes relative to known human and, and geologic history and then the cumulative probability correlations and regressions that that resulted essentially i used the same types of algorithms that we would use in a artificial intelligence to follow patterns and um, i basically built a, a model that tried to decide whether or not we were living in prophetic times when that model produced an extraordinary outcome of 1.4 trillion to one um, that became the secondary theme um, I didn't want to get into the involved in, in dogma or doctrine or religious proselytization. I was really trying to take the approach that what a prophecy was about how, not about how a uh, God would come and destroy the world, but how humanity through its pride and its greed and its hubris and its tribalism would essentially accomplish that goal. And as climate started to occur and populations started to grow and pollution started to become a global issue. Um, I started to see these trends and, and, and that's what led to that. So when I talk to people about artificial intelligence, um, I, I, because I'm a thriller writer, 
Um, I, I admit my job as a thriller author is to look at realistic scenarios and technologies and then try to ask the fundamental, simple, but profound question, gee, what could go wrong? Um, and with artificial intelligence, there are, there is so much that it gave me a, a, several books worth to talk about. Um, and so that's, that's where I start. Now, artificial intelligence is an amazing technology. Uh, I've been in the technology industry for decades. I can say that it's probably one of the most profound things we've ever done. More profound, it's as profound, if not more so than the internet, creating the internet, connecting the world, um, which changed the world in a in hundred different ways. Um, it's more profound than um, social media, which had some benefits and negatives as well. Um, I tell people that if power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, artificial intelligence will become the most profound power shift in all of history. And there's a number of reasons I say that. Um, unlike computer technologies that we've developed to this point, um, artificial intelligence has the ability to train and teach itself, oftentimes in things that the developer never imagined that the artificial intelligence would learn. Uh, we have examples of learning by somewhat by accident that artificial intelligence have trained itself on things like research level chemistry or how to read MRI scans by looking how to read minds by reading MRI scans. We were looking at the app, but uh, the the AI to find cancer cells or to find other abnormalities. And and so artificial intelligence is amazing. Every there's a, and there's multiple types of artificial intelligence. I think your users should probably st we should start with that um, there. And each type has a different type of risk profile uh, from very little to um, extremely high. Um, most of the artificial intelligence that we had developed and that are on the market today were based on what we would call artificial narrow intelligence. And what that means is we've got, it's got a very narrow niche of what it's perfecting, what it's learning, what it's being trained on, how it's being used, such as using uh, artificial intelligence to find cancer scales in, in a CAT scan or an MRI, um, uh, or how to um, perfect the trajectory of, of a rocket, or how to uh, find and highlight um, um, uh, hate speech on social media. And so most of the time we're using artificial intelligence in very narrow ways. And, and, and those are really profound ways, but in every scenario where we're using a narrow form of artificial intelligence, we have found that it can very quickly outperform um, humans on, on, on those tasks. Uh, and these are highly trained humans. And we, we all remember the example of the Watson computer uh, basically beating the uh, international chess champion. But we have computers that we go Google uh, experiment with computers that um, uh, also taught them how to basically win in the uh, Chinese game of strategy game of Go, which is a much more complex game than chess. And Google not only found, got spent a year getting an artificial intelligence to beat the international Go champion, but they created a second AI and they simply taught it the rules of the game and told it to give the parameter the goal to win. And it trained itself in less than a month on how to beat the first AI computer 100% of the time. And so we're, we're um, Jeffrey Hinton, who's one of the fathers of AI, has said that his, he quit, he resigned from Google because of these concerns. And one of his concerns is that we, we thought that we could create um, artificial intelligence to think like we could, to use the same sort of, sort of neural networks and processes that we, we use to, to learn. And what we discovered is that it was much better at it than we are. Much better at learning, much faster, much more comprehensive. The current version of GPT we, um, most people are aware of the product called ChatGPT, which a company called OpenAI really launched a year ago today. And it quickly ramped into one of the most popular products of all time. Um, within two months, it had 100 million users. And But that's an open source. Um, the, the, the fundamental intelligence behind that is an open source platform, which means that multiple companies can contribute to it and build applications off of it. The GPT-4 platform that it's built off of um, has an IQ, 
was tested, has an IQ of about 155. Now that's already smarter than 99% of the people on the planet. It grew tenfold from GPT 3.5 in less than six months. GPT 5 or three, GPT 3.5 rather, it grew. GPT 5, which will come out in 2024, is expected to continue that curve and is estimated to have an IQ of closer to 1600, roughly five times smarter than any human on the planet. And that's just the beginning. GPT-6, GPT-7, and beyond will continue to grow in its essentially intelligence um, and, and ability to span over multiple types of uh, programs, and multiple types of uh, human knowledge. Um, it's a powerful technology. Um, people are worried about students, college students using it to cheat on exams. People are, are, are worried about it being used to write misinformation. People are worried about it being used to write books um, um, and to it can create videos and images and do all kinds of things um, in an extremely rapid and cost-effective way. It can write code. Um, one of the form forms of machine learning is the ability for the machine to readjust, rewrite its own code as it discovers and experiments and explores new ways of solving a problem. And so that fundamental ability to write code can be can be used and, and people are using GPT-4 to do this, to write code from scratch. Um, and as a result, 20, Google two months ago laid off 20,000 workers, developers, because they can use um, AI to basically perform the coding work of those 20,000 workers. And in fact, one of the big dangers of AI is that it will create a huge, enormous uh, job displacement. Goldman Sachs three months ago released a report that predicted that AI could displace as many as 300, as high as 500 million jobs um, by 2030. Now, these are Unlike other industrial revolutions where we primarily impacted low skilled labor, manufacturing, production techniques, things like that, this industrial revolution will hit at the core of the middle class. We're talking medical careers, um, scientific careers, legal careers, architecture, engineering, design, software engineering, artwork and creative arts, um, graphic design, um, news, um, Microsoft laid off a bunch of their news staff and replaced it with AI uh, three months ago, about four or five months ago as well. And so we're going to see this trend continue. Um, and the challenge is, is that these are people that not only have to change companies, but people who have to relearn a new, more AI protect, you know, safe career. Now, um, that's no company, no country on earth, though, is ready for this sort of economic um, um, upheaval. Um, our deficits are high and we don't have any appetite to basically tax the rich in order to uh, to re to solve that problem. Uh, we don't have the funds to basically retrain people or support them through a long duration of unemployment. People are gonna, people could lose their houses. Some people at the lower ends of the, the economic scale could become homeless. And, and right now we don't have, there's, um, one of the uh, the former chief business officer of Google, a guy named Mo Gadot, basically says that AI is inevitable. There's no way of stopping it at this point. And so we're going to deal with these trends. It'll take over banking. It'll take over money supply. It'll take over a number of things. Um, and there are a number of problems. AI is not perfect. It's not a perfect technology. It can make flaws. It can teach itself things that were outside of the parameters, as I mentioned, that that we're, we want it to learn. And that could come in negative ways. Um, we're right now, um, about five years ago, there was a treaty called Laws Treaty, and that stands for Lethal Autonomous Weapon Systems. And the Laws Treaty essentially said that it's okay to use AI to um, make our weapons more efficient, more accurate. But it's not okay to use AI to take a life. There has to be a human in the decision process before we allow AI to take a life. But the challenge is, is that of all the 140 countries that signed on to this treaty, the United States, China, North Korea, Iran, Russia, and Israel did not. And each of those companies, countries rather, are 
already working on creating lethal autonomous weapon systems. And my book, Swarm, deals with one of those weapon systems that's being developed by DARPA today. Um, it, now, the benefit is, just as we saw in the computer transition, the professionals that learned how to use the new tools were the ones that were able to retain their jobs. So what I tell people, one of the ways that they can prepare for the AI um, tsunami is to find those tools, find those AI tools. And there's hundreds of applications right now coming onto the market based on AI. But to find those AI tools that are specific to your industry and get really, really, really good at them. Uh, become proficient with how they work, become proficient with the pros and the cons, learn the competitors, uh, get to be an AI expert within your industry. And that will be one of the things that will uh, allow you to maintain and hold on to that career longer. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to say, well, I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I don't need an, an artificial intelligence to tell me how to interpret the law. There's going to be medical professionals, there's going to be people from all every profession who are going to be either afraid of AI or resistant to learn this new tool that threatens their expertise. Um, those are going to be the people that are going to wind up having to um, deal with that problem earlier than later. Now, the other angle of AI, and stop me if you have any questions, because I could talk about this for hours. But the other angle of AI has to do with crime wave. Along with all of these other incredible applications that we're seeing based on this uh, GPT-4 platform that's already smarter than most humans and can write code, are products such as dark GPT or dark or fraud GPT, evil GPT, uh, worm GPT. These are AI applications that use that same level of intelligence and training and capability to write code, to write malicious code, um, the right phishing softwares, um, ransomware softwares, fake, deep fake um, um, extortion and blackmail. Um, we're already seeing um, families getting a phone call from their daughter or their aunt or their mother-in-law saying, I've been abducted. Um, they, they want $5 million or they want $100,000. They want $10,000. You gotta pay these guys or they threatening to kill me. And people are being fooled because it sounds exactly like their loved one. Um, and, but it's deep fake. Um, and so we're, we, we've been hearing the threat of deep fake video technologies uh, with regard to um, political misinformation. And we're going to see some of that. I believe we're going to see a tsunami of that in the 2024 election. Uh, but there are these, these applications are really good at imitating uh, real humans. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to be fooled by that, uh, run to the bank and, and try to pay this, this ransom before they realize that their daughter was at school the whole time. So one of the, the other things I tell people is if you get one of those phone calls, if you get a phone call like that, the first thing you should do is hang up and turn around and try to call. And they'll tell you, don't, don't call back or we'll know, you know, you know, uh, they'll make some sort of threat, but call them on their bluff. Immediately call back the, the, the phone of your loved one, because it could be, because they can spoof the number. They can look like it's coming in from that loved one, um, but they can spoof that number just like uh, um, hackers do today. And so, but you should be validating that. Make sure that it's truly the loved one that called you and not a deep fake. The other thing I try to warn people about is with facial recognition. There's been a really powerful trend over the last three to five years of people using uh, thumbprints or iris scans or facial recognition to access their telephone or their computers or other devices. Probably one of the most dangerous forms of uh, personal identification you can use. And here's why. Any computer can be hacked, especially now with AI tools. Um, about three years ago, maybe four years ago, there's a company called Clearview. Now, Clearview has a business of using facial recognition to process people through airports much faster. So you can skip that long security line and you can go directly through the line by using your face. And while that's 
a very cool convenience for people who who uh, travel a lot. It's Clearview was hacked th three or four years ago. 2.1 million identities were stolen and sold on the black market. Now, if somebody hacks my password and there's been 4 billion identity stolen in the last 10 years, most of them sold on the dark web to both Russia and China who are weaponizing them. Um, but if somebody hacks my password, that's a pain in the butt. I have to go through and go through all my different passwords and maybe reset them because I don't know which ones they might else they might have hacked, especially if I'm using the same password in multiple places. Um, but it you can reset it. It's it's a it's a pain. It's a loss. You might have some inconveniences. You might have some banking issues if they that part of that was your banking, but you can reset it. If somebody hacks your facial identity and sells it on the black market, they can use that digital form of your face and and pretend to be you anywhere. And there's no way that you're ever going to be able to reset that aspect of your identity. It's gone for good. And so technologies that we're, we're dealing with are so powerful that they, they open up a lot of new doors to us. Now, I tell everybody, AI is neither, even a super intelligent AI is neither evil nor benign. It can't learn to do things. It is learning from our patterns. So it is learning from our patterns of hate, our patterns of hypocrisy. It's learning that we talk about peace and then go to war. It's learning from those things. And we don't know exactly what from that it might learn. We can correct some of those things as we go, but there's always, it's always that correction is always going to follow it becoming a problem first. But it's neither evil or benign. And we'll talk about quantum computing in a second and how that could change. Um, but what we do know is that a powerful technology such as AI in the hands of a dictator, in the hands of a despot, in the hands of a warlord or a crime lord. Um, I think I'm still in the show. Um, I, um, or the hands of a politician or even a sociopathic billionaire could be a very, very dangerous tool when it comes to gaining more wealth and gaining more power over society. And so these are the things that we have to be aware of. Now, I've, I've lost Chris on my visual, so I think I'm going to keep going for a minute because it's still recording. So I'm going to assume that he's still there somewhere. So Chris, are you still there? Okay, well, I'll, I'll just I'll just continue on a little bit. In 2023, 1,500 AI experts, um, experts in the field from all over the world, signed an open letter that was sponsored by an MIT professor named uh, Max Tegmark. And the letter basically wanted all AI labs all over the world to pause for six months so that we could collectively work on the issues involved in this technology getting out of control. Uh, both control in terms of the technology itself and how to make sure that we keep AI from um, getting um, disassociated with its goals and objectives, and how do we keep AI, AI out of the hands of people who could uh, turn it into a weapon um, uh, on a number of levels. And unfortunately, not a single lab, um, government or commercial, agreed to that ban. And the reason is quite simple money and power. It, the technology is moving so fast that if any company waited six months without developing and further developing their AI, they would lose market share. They would lose the ability to compete with somebody who had ignored the ban. And so we're dealing with, and that's what we're dealing with, both at a national level uh, between China and the US, uh, North Korea, Russia, uh, Israel, and others, uh, and at a corporate level. Uh, we're dealing with companies who are moving forward at a super rapid pace because they're um, they're uh, concerned with not losing traction to somebody else who who moves forward faster. Um, so those are some of the key risks. Um, they, they pose risks to our individual level, to our jobs, to our economy, to national security, to our ability to wage war, to our ability to uh, um, conduct banking, um, to uh, crime waves that could come out of this. 
And so AI is a very profound technology. Now, as I said, there are some benefits. I recommend to people that they get good. It's not, not that the technology is bad. Um, AI will solve a number of big problems. AI will create some amazingly um, profound new services. Um, I use AI to create my marketing materials. Um, there's a number of uh, very positive and strong and, and proactive ways that we can use AI to make our lives more productive and, and to simplify tasks that we don't really want to do. Um, it will make some, there will be, like we saw in the every stage of the computer age, every major evolution, there'll be hundreds of companies coming out with products. And over time, those successful products and merger and acquisitions will whittle that down to a handful of um, very, very wealthy and powerful companies, tech companies who will control those technologies. And we're going to see that with artificial intelligence as well. Um, those companies will have tremendous power over the economy, over politics, over science, and over policymaking. And that will be good and bad to the extent that we can regulate those companies and regulate what they do. And the time for that regulation is was probably two years ago, but it's no time like the present. We're not really in a good political environment to move some of that legislation forward, unfortunately. Uh, and so that will get delayed. And the longer we delay, the harder it will be to rein them in. Um, I'm ca cautious about how much farther to go on this. Um, there's, there'll be positive. There you are, Chris. You yeah, there? So, yeah, this is a very interesting conversation. Um, how can people sure I still had you? <laughs> yeah, really uh, interesting. We may have you on a webinar in a future podcast session and um, tell people how they can follow, find you, follow you, reach out to you on social. It looks like you've got quite a extensive work. Yeah, uh, well, the first place, if you're interested in my books, is go to GuyMorrisBooks.com. Uh, you'll learn about the books there. Uh, you can get access to the to the buy links to the books. If you want an author signed copy, you can buy it from the website itself. Just look under the more category. Um, uh, it will also then link you. To, it, once you've read the books, I document the fact versus fiction. So you can see for yourself how much of the, the story is factual versus the p p things I made up. Um, and, um, and maybe stretch, stretch the truth a little bit. Um, if you're looking for me on social media, I'm on official Guy Morris Books on Facebook, Guy Morris Books on Twitter, author Guy Morris on Instagram, and Guy B. Morris on um, LinkedIn. Um, I do respond to people if they want to talk about the books um, and um, if you're interested in all of that. And um, I do research. I actually do a number of podcasts on artificial intelligence. I've got a um, press kit and a expert reel talking about AI on the website as well. I'm, I'm looking at getting uh, booked as a television expert guest. Um, and this is something I, I do. I continue to do research on almost daily uh, because it's moving that fast. And, and as much as I know, I, I'm, I'm always learning something new. Um, it's a fascinating field. Um, and um, I've had conversations with AI CEOs and AI engineers and developers and architects. And um, sometimes we agree that uh, and sometimes but um, I, I, I've always been able to basically shake their faith in the technology by talking about the things that their their companies don't want to talk about. Um, and uh, now that I've left Microsoft, I'm free to basically have that conversation. If you're interested in other books about AI specifically, I would recommend Mo Gadot, uh, G-A-W-A-T. Uh, Mo was the former chief business officer of Google, and he's written an amazing book called Scary Smart. Excellent. And for all the audience out there, let's thank um, Guy for coming on and uh, talking about AI. Really interesting, uh, in-depth, and all of his resources will be in the links and show notes. And with that, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate having me.